Chapter 11 Part 1, El Paso, Texas Samuel just sat there in deep thought, in a daze, after telling Cush about the events that happened in Tallulah. Dan Dottie? Dan Dottie! Samuel heard a small voice calling out his name. Cush looking up at him, why are you crying Dan Daddy? Samuel got up and started looking for some papers. Oh, here it is. As he returned to sit down, he said. Sorry about that. Prophetess Akilah Malik wrote these papers centuries ago, and she said it best, the war for the soul of humanity and planet Earth is real and unrelenting, the hardest to win when the souls for whom you fight are loyal allies of the enemy you face. You are, in effect fighting a war on two fronts. Worst of all, trying to save someone who doesn't know they are in danger, refuses to believe it when you tell them, and refuses to accept it even after they've seen the proof. That is the mindset of most of those we've encountered for some time now since returning to Louisiana, along with the varied isms. Sexism or men thinking they are superior to women. Racism or whites and other people of color thinking they are superior to black people or others of different shades than themselves. Classism or one group thinking they are superior to another because of what they possess or who they think they are. Elitism or those who think they are the apex and everyone else is the base. The saddest and most frustrating of all is dealing with the truth, you know, blatant and irrefutable, that none of this is anything more than an illusion created by the very enemy you fight. And you are fighting to pull people out of a burning house while they insist the enemy who fans the flames will save them. One definition of hell is the truth seen too late. Turning a few pages, Samuel said, here's another one I like by her. It would be nice if my people were as quick to notice the truth as they are birthday wishes or photos of cute babies. When the Torah says, my people perish for lack of knowledge, it is true. But they also perish because they choose to ignore knowledge when it is given. As Moses said, the people ate, drank, and rose up to play. Because it was easier than facing the truth, Dr. Richard King, scholar, once warned that the perpetual war against black people was never-ending and would continue until we create systems for fighting back. For decades, since the end of the Civil War, police and the prison system have been used to control the existence and freedom of the former black slaves and their descendants. The police were originally formed, evolving out of the posse to track down runaway slaves and later to protect whites terrified of retaliation following emancipation. They were at first paid bodyguards. Then evolved into community patrols into the municipal guardians they are today. It was never intended that black men should be among them since they were formed to regulate and control that very group. Statistics don't lie. As Dr. Richard King eloquently pointed out, this war is about revenge, retaliation, and retained control of a community all but a few moral whites and subwhites believe should have total equality and freedom. We, who were the young resistors of the civil rights era, tried to warn the elders of the day that unless and until we, like our Native American brothers and sisters, demanded our own free and independent nation within a nation, with all the rights and benefits we were thereto entitled, we would never know true freedom. As I said in a speech, I once gave to political candidates, freedom ain't free. They let us go, but kept our freedom hostage. The aim is to curtail and reduce our population by reducing and controlling the black male, seen as the greatest threat to white supremacy power and key to reproduction. The statistics speak for themselves. Recognizing this is one thing, changing it is another. Wiping the tears from his eyes, Samuel said, Sorry again son, I was just thinking about our people who have died from these STDs that have plagued the land, and I was thinking about them. Anyways, that's enough for today, I'm tired. Trying to change the subject, Cush asked, How do you talk to animals, Dan Daddy? Samuel, seeing the concern on Cush's face, smiled. Um, that's a hard one to explain. Scratching his head, it's more telepathically, um. But not really. I have to think about how to explain that one and get back to you on that. When you have been doing something so long, it's easy to do, but hard to explain. Samuel looked at Cush, son, it's getting late, come on back tomorrow. Gone on, before it gets any darker. The truth of the matter was Samuel was still emotionally upset and didn't want to continue, continue his story, but Cush was not sleepy and started asking Samuel more questions about his story. Dan Daddy, whatever happened to Uday when he went to Lake Providence? 
Samuel smiled and pointed at Cliff and Ron, sleeping on a couch across from them. Those are his descendants right there. Surrounding them were dishes and towels from the meals. Big Ma had bought them throughout the day as he told Cush his story. Clean up this mess, take the dishes to the sink, and go on home, tell your mother to send you over here after you have done your chores tomorrow. Cush was hesitant, honestly, Dan Daddy, after that story about those demons, I'm afraid to sleep tonight. Samuel stood up and stretched, do you know the Lord's Prayer? Cush quickly said, yes. Samuel looked at Cush, okay then, say that, and you will sleep just nicely, Samuel walked toward the kitchen and abruptly stopped, listen son, we are in a time and age where people say you have to say 50 Hail Marys or do this or do that for the Lord to hear you. They think everything about him is complicated. When you just need faith. Believe. Like that man that had leprosy, and thought dipping himself seven times in the Jordan River was too easy to be cured. I'm saying just become a friend to your creator and let him guide you. You see, everyone's friendship is different. Become his friend, you respect your friends here on earth. Respect him as if he is your friend. You know he doesn't like this or that, don't do this or that and learn his way like any other friend, and he'll guide you on the right path. I have a friend who cannot stand cigar smoke, so I do not smoke around him. That is respect, that's a friend. Cush still didn't want to go home and had heard many people say, don't ask that man about no poetry. He's good, but he'll wear you out with them. So he said, Dan Daddy, I heard you still write poetry. Billy rudely interrupted, Naman. Samuel said, what are you talking about Billy? Billy said, it was Naman who didn't want to dip himself in the Jordan River. You're getting old and can't remember shit. Yesterday you asked me how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Samuel looked at Cush, don't pay him no mind, he's just bored or something, I need to turn him off. Billy said, I don't get bored and turn me off, motherfucker I don't have no on and off switch. Besides, you need me to monitor the area, the weather and the chatter going on around the world, with your crying ass. Samuel sighed, come on now Billy, it's too late in the evening for this shit. You play way too much. Billy said. Fuck you. Samuel turned around, fuck you too asshole. Samuel was determined to send Cush on his way, but he knew he was still bothered about the story of Incubus and Succubus, so Samuel turned around and took a seat in his chair, now we've talked about this already. Poetry runs in the family, but since I know what you're trying to do. And. I love poetry, I'll let you off the hook, this time. Okay. I'll tell you a few, and then you'll have to go. Billy said, oh shit, why did you ask him about poetry, anything but poetry? Hell, ask me. Samuel shook his head, I wrote this one thinking about how it used to be in the olden days. Clearing his throat, he said, perfect world. Grandfather's smoking like a train. As he grasps for air to breathe. Mother's cursing. Father's ducking from the things thrown in the air. Sons and daughters are growing up so fast. Saying, life isn't fair. Grandmother's fussing because nutrients are missing. No food in the house. No, no, not a thing in the kitchen, not even a mouse. No clean clothes anywhere. Not even a fresh pair of underwear. Everyone screaming, this living is unfair. This country is singing like birds with words of foolishness and pride. Foolishness and pride that we despise. City rushing like ants on a hill. As she prepares for war. Drugs dancing as it captures their prisoners. Returning them to jail. Schools praying, for they know. It is they who are sending us to hell. But who cares? Jobs dying. As they try to reach the unreachable money crying out. For its cousin's greed and pride. That can be seen even in your eyes. Husband sinking because he is unable to pay his rent. Preachers crying, for they have no more stories to tell. Grass waving like little children, as they wait patiently. To speak to the sun for growth. Or even the moon to be able to sleep. Dog barking like selfish women. Who can't have their way. Fleas biting. 
as they work their nine to five to survive all this jive while sitting on their prey. Diseases lurking in the darkness. Is all this making you blue? It's happening because of you. As death waiting patiently for the moment to grab you. Taking you to its home. Your final resting place. Grown men yelling like little girls. As we all try to live. In this perfect world. Samuel flipped a few pages, oh. I like this one too, signs of the times. I asked so many questions. Not one could be answered, had to learn them on my own. Why didn't anyone know the answers to my questions? Were they so hard? Had to realize some of them alone, on my own. Searched and searched. Still, no one could answer these questions. Except him, who knows everything. Goodness and mercy is his name. Asked about hunger, pain, and suffering. Asked about mankind and prejudice, envy and hatred. Explain, explaining how we all go through all these things today. While other things get in the way. Generations getting worse than the one before it. Those that were strong, but humble, will make it past the test. The test of time. Telling me. It would soon be over, it would no longer exist. Telling me. It was going to get worse, before it gets better. Telling me. It was all written. In the signs of the times. Samuel finally sent Cush home, but bright and early, Samuel saw Cush outside staring at Gemini as if he was trying to speak to him. Cush stood there for ten minutes before he continued to the house. As he was knocking on the door, Samuel shouted. Come on in. Looking at his emotions, he asked, I see you were trying to talk to old Gemini. Did you get anywhere? Cush said out of frustration, no. Samuel smiled, just keep trying, one day, we'll go out there and try it together. They talked for a while, and Big Ma made them a big breakfast as usual, and then the two of them headed to his study. Samuel took a sip of coffee, well now, we left off where Wanyan Yekavu met Incubus and Succubus, but let's fast forward a bit. He was in Tallulah for three months and learned a lot about his family and some important things that would prepare him emotionally for his trip to Arizona. Samuel paused, well, after he left Tallulah, he traveled alone for four more months or so, many days were delightful and encouraging, and some were very hard and rigorous, but Wanyanyekavu was transforming into the man that Sabaoth wanted him to be. Traveling by foot by day, resting at night to avoid heavily populated areas and men altogether, for the time being, because Mletzi told him, it was not the time. But Wanyanyekavu was learning a deeper understanding of each component of man's totality. Wanyanyekavu saw the difference between the traditions of man and spirituality. They got close to three metro areas along the way that would last from three months to six months, whereby each major stop intensified the training. One site was just a few miles north of the micro, Shreveport, Louisiana. Then he headed southwest near Metro Dallas, then, he headed to the abandoned cities of Ardmore, and on to Abilene, Texas. Once in Abilene, Wanyanyekavu finds himself in a thick wooden forest after training, heading west, he noticed the animals walking alongside him as if they knew him. The scenery started changing as he watched two squirrels chasing each other. They appear to be chasing each other in slow motion. With his attention focused on the squirrels, he suddenly turns and sees he's in the middle of the desert, as a rattlesnake slither right by him. Confused about what just happened, he stopped and said to himself. What's this? Deja vu? Mletzi appeared before him, Wanyanyekavu said, I'm confused, I don't know the differences between reality and my dreams. I was just in a wooden area, and now I'm suddenly in the desert. But I didn't see what was in front of me but rather a dream I had many months ago. Mletzi said calmly, turn around. You'll see you have walked at least a mile in the desert. Here, the environment you are used to has abruptly ended and it will be a while before you return to it. You were indeed somewhere else from when you left our last location until now. I hoped you could find that place and know the differences between the two. I need you to concentrate and learn this for a reason. Sabaoth has been dealing with you since you left home. Introducing it to you in dreams that now have come to pass, and it's growing stronger for a reason. 
I will explain later as you learn that difference. Now, continue to travel west.